So these are preliminary thoughts, and the brief was, what have we learnt about the Conservative Party? The first thing I think is absolutely fascinating to me during the campaign was that this was possibly the narrowest campaign I could have ever imagined a political party fighting. As somebody who has spent some years analysing party campaigns and their effects, it was just extraordinary. I mean, not, not surprising, but just really striking that you could almost see it happening. You could see David Cameron being asked a question about something else and starting to answer it and then saying, oops, sorry, I've got to say, with a stronger economy, we can do X, Y, Z. With a stronger economy, you know, competence versus chaos, competence versus chaos, competence versus chaos. It was amazing, and this is why. These are our British election study data before the campaign. We're asking people, do you think things are getting better or worse? The only thing that people saw as getting better was the national economy. Some people thought that would be offset by the fact that people weren't feeling it personally in their pockets, this cost of living crisis, which Labour were putting at the heart of the campaign to try to neutralise that conservative advantage on the economy. You know, what is striking here is that you know, that probably didn't happen, but what is also striking is here is a party that has won a majority with really, truly only one issue that people thought they were doing better on. And actually, if you think, you know, here we're asking, do people think immigration is getting lower? So we're assuming there that that's a negative thing if people think immigration is getting higher. And for most people it is. Only 3% of people thought immigration was getting lower. Only 7% of people thought the NHS was getting better. Obviously, there you see classic party competition where Labour's trying to focus you on the NHS, on, it, on health, and trying to say that, yes, OK, the economy might be getting better, but you know, you're not feeling it. Whereas the Conservative Party just really, fr frank frankly, fought a ruthless, ruthlessly narrow campaign on one issue, which was the economy. So, so that's the first observation. And uh, it, was, it was strategically predictable, but nevertheless, it was, I think, quite unique. The other message I wanted to give, and I just, I just want to talk for a few moments about this, and it is exactly um, just what Peter was just um, finalising on, which is that the Conservative Party have not improved their electoral position in terms of the popular support that they have in the country. And so they have a 0.8% increase in their share of the vote nationally. And, you know, given the other things that are going on, i.e. the collapse of the Liberal Democrats, the collapse of Labour in Scotland, I mean, just not just a bit of a collapse, an extraordinary collapse of the Lib Dems, an extraordinary collapse, un, you know, unthinkable collapse a year ago of Labour in Scotland. This is a small increase. And one of the things that I wrote about in 2010, I guess, you know, I'm in danger of sounding like a bit of a stuck record. I was, in 2010, I was arguing this is not a recovery. You know, this might be very good for the Conservative Party. Is my mic not on? Oh, my slides have fallen asleep. Here we are. Oh, actually, Mike, the reason was I was... Hiding them. Oh. I'll bring them back. I'll bring them back, I promise. Um, there isn't a technical hitch, all is well. Um, you know, I was arguing in 2010 that if you look at the Conservative Party support, so we look at, as you know, people that study elections, we look at, do you identify with a party? Do you have a, a sense of party affiliation? And what you saw in 1992, you know, which is now obviously over 20 years ago, is a collapse in those people who were saying that they identified with the Conservative Party. And that collapse had never recovered. I mean, obviously, there's a bit of replacement, genera generationally, there's a word, but it hasn't recovered, and it hasn't recovered yet. And whereas Labour's potential support was, was higher than its vote in the last election, whereas Labour, um, Conservatives' vote, if, if, you, if you measure that as those people who still identified with Labour, was higher than the number of people who were willing to vote for the party, the people who are willing to vote for the Conservative Party is higher than those people who say that they are a Conservative. And that really hasn't changed. And so, you know, what we're looking at is a really long period. So, so how do we, given that those facts, given the fact that the Conservative Party, as Peter said, the Conservative Party was not loved. Certainly Labour is a more liked party than was its leader, whereas for the Conservatives, the leader was more liked than the party, but nevertheless the leader wasn't very much liked. And I think Peter just said that too, that David Cameron was not loved. And that was absolutely the case. So how did the Conservative Party win this election if it hasn't improved significantly its appeal to the country? 
Well, one, of course, I've just really alluded to it. <laughs> Two parts of that puzzle have to be the fact that we punished the Liberal Democrats wholesale in this election for going into coalition with the Tories, for reneging on promises, um, for changing their policy positions or the appearance thereof, and so on. The other, of course, is Labour's very, very, very significant collapse in Scotland, but also Labour's failure to take advantage of a lot of that Liberal Democrat collapse, and I'll talk about that in a second. The other reason I think that the Conservative Party did so well is that that translation of Liberal Democrat votes away from the Liberal Democrat Party went to Labour but benefited the Tories. And this is, you know, one of the fascinating things. If you look at the proportion of people who moved from the Lib Dems, where did they go, the proportions? Well, about a third of those people went to Labour, so we can see this because we know how they voted in 2010, we know how they intend to vote in 2015. The proportions of those Liberal Democrats who were saying they were going to vote Tory, Green or UKIP was just above that whole proportion who said they were going to vote Labour. So what you have is a story of the majority of Lib Dem votes going to the, to the Labour Party, but that benefiting the Conservatives in many Conservative Liberal Democrat seats. And there were two thirds of the Liberal Democrat seats where they were fighting primarily with the Tories. And that collapse of votes from the Liberal Democrats went to a third party or went to the Labour Party. Or, well, some, some went to the Conservatives, but it's not a story, a sort of paradoxical story, I think it would have to be that people move from the Lib Dem. People were so upset with the Lib Dems going into coalition with the Tories that they went and voted Tory. Some people did actually, but not very many. So that's part of the story. And then the other thing that is really important for the Conservatives is the UKIP vote that went back to the Tories, but it went back to the Tories strategically. And, and I think a lot of the answer to this puzzle is the strategic decision, but it's going to take us a long time to unravel lots of those factors. And Rob um, was talking about this in terms of the exit poll, in terms of where UKIP was punishing Labour more in the North and not punishing the Tories in the South. And the reason I think we have that is for this reason. So what we have here is this is just the first four weeks of the election campaign, so we haven't updated this yet, but the patterns aren't going to change, just the numbers are going to get bigger. So these are the people who are switching. So these are those UKIP voters that are switching to the Tories. And they're doing that where conservative part, the Conservative Party is fighting Labour. So these are Conservative Labour marginals. These are places where UKIP voters can keep out a Labour MP, either keep out a kick out a Labour MP or fight off a, la a possible Labour win. And here is the same change where the Liberal Democrats are fighting the Conservatives. So here again, what you have is the UKIP voters going to the Tories, possibly in the majority going back to the Tories, in order to keep out a party which is ostensibly to a UKIP voter on the left, so a Labour or Liberal Democrat. Now, where they don't have that choice, which incidentally most commonly occurs in the north of England, is in those constituencies in which they couldn't elect a Conservative MP. And so Rob was talking about the distribution of votes, how the Conservative vote was a lot more efficient, and this is one of the reasons for that. And so a lot of this is about the, the translation of votes to seats in key constituencies. The other reason I think we have the result is exactly to build on what Rob was saying about disproportionality disproportionality and about the efficiency of the Conservative votes. So this is partly about turnout, it's partly about the Conservative Party getting people to vote for them where it counted. One of the mysteries, and I think one of the jobs for the Labour Party, is to figure out why in England, and obviously we have to now, more than ever, think about countries within the UK as opposed to the whole of the UK in order to understand electoral outcomes. One of the reasons that Labour, on a 3.6% increase in their vote share in England, got a net increase of 15 seats, whereas the Conservative Party, on a 1.4% increase in share of the vote in England, got a net increase of 21 seats. Now, we've always thought that, that disproportionality ran against the Conservatives and towards Labour, but that has now changed. And John Curtis um, says some really uh, presented some really fascinating things just last week on Friday, just addressing this issue, addressing that question of efficiency. So, so and, and, as, and I think, I can't remember who said it, but we don't yet know if this is a successful Conservative campaign or coincidence, I think it was Rob, but this is one of the things that we have to explain. Then finally, the question is, you know, was there something? Was there something in this election campaign that did actually swing it to the Tories? 
Was it possible that the Conservative Party managed to make everybody vote on the basis of the economy? And so one thing we didn't see is an increase in the likelihood of people saying that the economy was their most important issue. And that's not surprising, but nevertheless it's interesting. This hasn't, you know, people aren't suddenly saying, I mean, those are random fluctuations and we might start, you know, we might start modelling to see what happened on some of those days where it, where it declines. It just could be random fluctuation in polling um, sampling. But essentially what we don't find is an increase in people saying, yes, the economy is really important. Neither do we see a significant increase, or any increase, frankly, that's not um, larger than the margin of error around these estimates of the Conservative Party rated as the best party on the, con on the economy. And these are, these are from the British Election Study, the daily data. But what we might see, and we don't, you know, this requires quite a lot of statistical modelling, we might see an increase in the use of the economy as a, as a predictor of people's vote intentions. And we might see that strategically where it counts. And that will be a very interesting thing. And it's something, it's one of the things that I'm going to be working on over the coming weeks and months. The other question is, you know, was there this last late last minute swing and I don't yet we don't yet know the answer to this and all we have is the ability to look at our data and start to try to model it and so what I'll show you now is just those daily data on a few things that does look like there was a widening of the gap and what I'll suggest here is there's some caveats one is yet we don't yet know if this is because there were just more conservatives answering the survey in the last days we've done some work to kind of control for these factors but nevertheless there's much more to do and the other thing we don't know and I think this addresses Peter's point which is you know is it the case that there was actually a change or were these people kind of in a sense you know just coming to the preferences that they already held or illustrating the preferences that they already held all along this kind of teasing of the Conservative Party which you know which is a funny thing to think about on the aggregate you know of, of um, all voters but nevertheless um, might happen for some individuals and so we've got some data that can, uh, can address these questions and it does suggest that you know, we ask people which leaders perform best in the election campaign. And you know, up to the point where I went into the ITV studios, we kind of had it to about here. And of course, what we then see is a widening of the gap in the last week. We do see the sense that people started saying yes. Obviously, David Cameron's blue and Ed Miliband's red here. We do see there's a slight decline for Ed Miliband, or, or actually, frankly, not very much change for Ed Miliband, but there's a, a widening of that gap in terms of who voters thought did the best campaign in the last week. And as I say, you know, perhaps these voters were, you know, perhaps this was a, a, a realisation that people made, perhaps this was an effect of what the party campaigns did, or perhaps this was people, you know, essentially just coming back to their earlier preferences. We do also see a, a significant widening of the gap on this question, which was who do you trust to do a good job in government? It's just sort of a broad question about competence, about what we would call valence. And we do see an opening up of the gap there between the Conservatives and the Labour Party in the last couple of days. And then also the same in terms of how people felt about each of the leaders, a widening of the gap between um, David Cameron and Ed Miliband. And so there's a, you know, there's a, there is an argument, I think, that there is certainly evidence that we need to explain away that there could have been a last-minute shift. There could have been something about this campaign that made voters, given then the last coming to make their vote choice, made them really assess which leader, who they wanted as prime minister and who they wanted in the number 10. And we knew this was central to the election campaign. We knew this was central all along, and we know as as others have said, that you know, the economy especially is an incredibly important part of the vote choice. So what does this tell us about the Conservative Party? What have we learned about this political party and its strategy and, and what we kind of can, can infer? Is this, a, is this a really successful Conservative Party? Is this a Conservative Party that's done well because of its strategies, because of the choices that it's made? In spite of the moderation, modernization project somewhat coming to a faltering halt as this party went into government and frankly made decisions that were very unpopular with many people, you know, is this kind of somewhat vindicated? And all I would suggest is that we've learned is that when the Conservative Party has a narrow issue advantage, or bite, on, or bite on an issue that's as important as the economy, a narrow lead and a very narrow targeting strategy, and when their two main rivals collapse, then they can win a narrow overall majority. And that this is a very, very, very large, the, part of the very large part of the explanation for this is the distribution of their votes into their parliamentary seats. Now, one's kind of sting in the tail, I think, extra sting in the tail for the Labour Party, and again, John Curtis has been talking a lot about this, is that that disproportionality and also that 
the, the, the real mountain that Labour has to climb in Scotland could mean that the swings that have to now occur towards Labour are just bigger than, than we've ever thought they, they would be in order for Labour now to win a majority. So on a narrow election campaign, on a narrow issue agenda, on a narrow um, lead, the Conservative Party might be keeping the Labour Party out of power for the very foreseeable future. And so I would argue that that's you know, very much effect, uh, uh, a product of that effective messaging, a product of the collapse of the major rivals, and, and certainly not a product of a broadening of their popular appeal.